John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he saw a vision of the risen Jesus, exalted as king of the world. And he was standing among seven burning lights. And John's told this is a symbol of the seven churches in Asia Minor that's been adapted from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus starts addressing the specific problems that face each church. Some were apathetic due to wealth and affluence. Others were morally compromised. Their people were still eating ritual meals and sleeping around in pagan temples. But others among the churches remained faithful to Jesus, and they were suffering harassment and even violent persecution. And Jesus warns that things are going to get worse. A tribulation is upon the churches that will force them to choose between compromise or faithfulness. By John's day, the murder of Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero was passed, and the persecution of Christians by Emperor Domitian was likely underway. And so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. And Jesus calls them to faithfulness so that they can overcome or literally conquer. And Jesus promises a reward for everyone in these churches who does conquer. Each reward is drawn directly from the book's final vision about the marriage of heaven and earth. And so this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? And why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. Hi there, we're moving in our study into Revelation chapter 2, and uh, as you notice immediately, in chapter 2 and 3, there are seven specific messages to seven literal first century churches. You had a good setup in that uh, little video clip you just watched from the, this uh, Bible project, and you'll be seeing more clips of that if you continue watching these videos throughout Revelation. One of the things that's fascinating to me is the uh, literary nature of this. Not only is it a vision, but it is crafted in a way that is very specific and unique and complex and meaningful. For example, you'll notice in every one of these seven messages some similarities as well as some differences. You'll notice that each of them begin with a, a little portion of the vision of Jesus, the description of Jesus from John's vision in chapter 1. In each of those descriptions, are very specific to either the warning or the promises to that particular church. Also, each of these messages ends with a warning and a promise, and the promise to those who are victorious, to those who overcome, is some, some portion of what we're told about in the last two or three chapters, when the earth is made new and uh, the, the righteous are saved for eternity, they're with the Lord. And for example, in Revelation 22, we're told we're going to be able to eat of the tree of life. And that tree of life was in the Garden of Eden before sin entered, and then Adam and Eve were forbidden from eating from that tree. And the redeemed are going to, once again, in the New Jerusalem, there's like this big park in the middle of the New Jerusalem described in chapter 22 that includes access to the tree of life. And you'll see that as the promise here in the, to the first church in Ephesus. Also, each one of these messages start with the words, I know. Jesus knows very much what is going on in your life and mine, as well as in his churches. And uh, most of them begin with commendation. Um, good job, church. Here's some things I see you're doing. With the exception of the last, Laodicea. Uh, and, and then most of them also have a turn where there is um, correction, where there's a rebuke. And again, there's two churches that are an exception. One is Smyrna and the other is Philadelphia. They get only praise. Things were really rocking in those churches. They were very healthy, apparently. Um, and it, as I've read this, I started wondering to myself, yeah, I've read it over and over, but I've really been reading it heavily uh, in preparation for these talks. And I started thinking to myself, what, what uh, would Jesus say specifically to Grace Place? And what kind of com commendation would he give us? I certainly hope there would be a few things on his list. Um, what kind of rebuke, what kind of correction suggestions might he give us? I wouldn't be surprised if there would be some of those too. And, and so let's be open to what the Spirit is saying to us as we go through this, as individuals, as a small group, and as a, as a faith community. 
And um, each one of these concludes with the same words, by the way, and, and that is, um, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. So let's pray that we can open up our ears because it's not talking about these ears. It's talking about the heart. It's talking about our spiritual ears. It's talking about being attuned and opened and listening to the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's enough for a general overview. It's time for you to open the Bible and get into your discussion. These questions we provide you, actually Pastor Kelly is writing these during this series, and I appreciate collaborating with her, and I'm sure you appreciate what she gives you. You don't have to stay rigid with these questions if you decide you want to take a little turn, and, and uh, you can go beyond the, the passages here if you want to go farther into the text. But hopefully this will be helpful as you get started. It's going to be fun because we want you to talk about love. And maybe think about a time when you were first in love and what that was like and um, what it's like to get back to that when you start to lose it, either in a relationship like a marriage, a dating relationship, a friendship, or more importantly, in our relationship with the Lord. Because as we'll see, this first church, Ephesus, has lost their first love and Jesus gives some clues as to how to get it back. Hope you have a good study.